we are here to try to understand continuity on abstract metric spaces. And the first thing you notice is that you can generalize the delta epsilon definition pretty much the way it worked for functions from real numbers to real numbers. All you do is just you, you take note of the different metric spaces. So here we have metric space D. Here we have metric space rho. And we might say that the function f is continuous at a particular x. If given epsilon bigger than 0, you are able to find a function delta of epsilon, which when d between x and y, the distance from x to y is less than this delta, that will imply that the image of f of x and the image of f of y will be within a distance of epsilon away from one another. And so you remember, at heart, what, what is continuity? It's only that idea that points are not moved far apart. Points that used to be close together will remain, to, remain close together. And this is a little bit vague because what you can do is, in essence, a continuous function can take a piece of matter and it can stretch it. In fact, it can stretch um, a bounded piece of matter to be infinitely wide. So it's like an elastic rubber band. A continuous function might bring points together, as in if I take a stapler and I bring those points that used to be far apart, I can bring them close together. But the idea is, we're going to learn that more precisely, is that a continuous function may never rip a connected piece of matter. So this piece of paper is one whole, one connected piece of matter. A continuous function will never tear it apart. And so what does it mean? It means that, that in terms of sequence is that if I look at a particular point and I draw a sequence of points that converge to that one point, then no matter what happens after the transformation, the images of the sequence of those points will converge to f of x. In terms of delta epsilon, uh, that's just uh, again saying that the, the points are not going to be moved uh, exceptionally far apart. In other words, I, I can always uh, just, just select the points x and y close together, and I'll see that their image is within that epsilon. So I hope you have a sense of what I'm talking about. Now, we are going to define continuous functions in terms of sequences. We are going to define them in terms of uh, distances and in terms of open balls. So to understand the, the definition in terms of open sets, look what happens. So the statement of delta epsilon immediately implies that the ball of radius delta centered at x will be mapped within a ball of radius epsilon centered at f of x. And now this statement is the same as uh, saying that the ball, the full neighborhood around x, is in the pre-image of the ball of neighborhood of size epsilon around f of x. So let me try to explain what that might mean in terms of this picture. So you have here a curve which is a typical continuous curve from calc 1. Now here I picked f of x and here I selected the neighborhood of f of x. Right? So that's a neighborhood of, of radius epsilon. What is this? This is simply the ball, the ball of radius epsilon around f of x. It's this thing. Now I want to understand how the pre-image, how is the pre-image of this ball going to look like? The pre-image is again all the points which are mapped by the function f to this ball. So let's see what the pre-image might look like. So what I do is I take this, the boundaries of this ball and I, and I just extend them through and likewise I extend The other thing through, and then I make uh, I make a note, right? So here, look at it. So maybe I'll use another color. So look what happens. So you see that that points in here. So this region, this whole region, is mapped into the ball. Also. This whole region this whole region is mapped into the ball. 
Yes? Where else? Actually, oh, so, so this whole region, then there is, uh, there is a little bit of a skippage. Now you look here. And you can see that, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure where this terminates, but clearly all the way to here, it extends a little farther than this curve. I'm not sure where. Let's say maybe if the curve, if the curve terminates, say, if the curve, let's say, just here it begins to steeply go up, then this green segment here will terminate You see that, what I'm talking about? So you see that there is one open connected, I'm going to mention it, just one interval, uh, open interval, another open interval where X is contained, and yet other open intervals where um, we are all going to be mapped within this open ball of radius epsilon. So what are those things? Those are the inverse images of the ball of radius epsilon around f of x. You see what I'm talking about? Where and where is the a ball of radius? Where is the ball of radius delta? F. Bijective over what? In this picture, it doesn't look like it's bijective uh, at all, right? It's 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 not one to one. Bijective means one to one. It's clearly not one to one. So, no, it's not injective. It cannot be bijective. But where do you see the ball uh, centered at x, uh, at x? Well, you might take this region here, just extend the wing, or the the wing, and this is the ball of radius delta. That's my delta. You see what I'm saying? So you, you draw those pictures and what do you observe? You, basically what you do is you play this game. Draw a curve that you imagine to be continuous and, well, in other words, draw a curve without lifting your, your marker. And then just uh, pick any point on the x-axis um, and see where it goes, pick any neighborhood around f of x, and what you see is that the pre-images of that neighborhood are always going to be open intervals. You see, a, a bunch of open disjoint intervals. In other words, the pre-image of the open ball will be an open set. You understand the central idea? Pre-image of, uh, of the open ball around f of x is always an open set. Set when F is continuous. Okay? And I mean continuous not just at X, this was a definition at X, but continuous pretty much throughout, uh, throughout the domain. And now you try the same game, and if the curve is not going to be continuous, you make a, a rip in this curve, you will be able to find a situation where an open ball, its pre image, is not an open set. If, if the curve is ripped, it will not going to be an open set. Should I try to give an example? Let's see. So let's say I found an X at which we have a discontinuity and say it looks like this. So that is that's let's say an example of a discontinuous map. And then uh, I see I try to play the same game. Let's try to see where, where x goes. In this case I, I made it less continuous so the x is going to be is going to go here, right? So this is my f of x. So 
Now I can select a very small, very small open ball around this. So something like this. And like this. And then I try to see what's going to be the pre image. So if I extend this here. What's going to be the, the pre-image of that open ball? This is some ball of radius epsilon around fx. What's going to be the pre-image? Well, we have this pre-image here. So this lower bound, I don't know where it goes. So, yeah, But here we have what appears to be some open set, it extends somewhere in this direction. Maybe it will be open, maybe not. But uh, uh, then we have uh, then we have this region here. This is open. Yeah. And now notice everywhere else this is this is skipped. So what happens here is that the last point that uh, that's mapped in here, right, is uh, is here and it is closed. It's half open interval here. And uh, this means not open. What's not open? What's not open is the inverse of this particular ball. You see why? Because at this x, there is this uh, edge. That's the last point that's mapped there. Any other point? Okay, presumably, you see, it goes on. So no point beyond this x is ever going to be mapped to this open ball. That makes this neighborhood, this particular neighborhood, not an open neighborhood. Yes? If you consider the dashed blue line to be f of x equals some constant, you could find the intersection between f of x and that blue line. So why is it, why is it open and not closed? Because it exists, right, that, that point? So the function goes, you see, I selected this ball really small to avoid, this is where the curve continues. I drew a discontinuous curve, it's discontinuous at x. What's happening is, in places where it's continuous, where the blue line intersects, it creates open intervals. So when you have two intersections, like between the lower and upper bound, that generates an open interval here, uh, on this open green interval. But in, in the region where we look at x, you can see that, uh, that you have half open interval. So this part, you see, this part is, this part is open, but over here, there is nothing, uh, x is mapped into this, blue, uh, into this blue strip, but nothing to the right of x is ever mapped to this blue strip. So that's, that's not an open set. Yes? This might be an obvious question, but if we switched, um, there's this continuity, if we set that, uh, the point on top was included and the point on the bottom was not included, would it still be an open set? Uh, well, so if you, if you switch and you see you're saying so, Shade the, shade the top. Uh, uh, right, but then still you don't have a full neighborhood of x. All right, so uh, it would be open, but uh, but then again, then 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 this uh, again, you have to be careful. So if I, I shade it here, this blue region will actually have to be shifted. Where where is this blue region drawn around? It's drawn around uh, f of x. So if f of x is here, the entire blue region is not where I drew it. The situation will be similar. Right? The point is, uh, what, what I'm trying to suggest is that, again, play around with, with such similar pictures, and you should observe the following, that when you have a continuous function, whenever you look at the graph of the continuous f uh, function and you draw a horizontal strip through its graph, the pre-images, uh, or the things that are mapped into the horizontal strip, are always going to be open intervals, a bunch of open intervals. One of such open intervals will, will contain the point x. And that's what this statement is saying. This statement is just a, a, based on this logic, I know that always happens. But 
if I have a discontinuous function based on the similar logic, that should not be the case, right? If function is not continuous, the mathematics implies that there will be some epsilon for which no matter how small delta, this ball is never part. Okay? So that means that the point x will not have an open neighborhood surrounding it. Okay? x will not be defended. If there is no continuity, what, what happens in essence, what, you, what happens, right? So it's like the function is lifting you up, right? So it's, it's lifting you up into another space. So if you're a bunch of, uh, you're, you're this religious sect, maybe you remember, I forgot their name, they, they flew into another dimension, you know, in 1995 or 97. So you know, you know what I'm talking about? You do. So what happens is, if it's a continuous lift, right, they stand around in a neighborhood, a kind of, let's say, one point X, and around me, my friends, we are lifted together, we are moving to the same place. Our neighborhood is not broken, right? We are moved all together, like what happens in here. Where this, this orange neighborhood is all moved all together inside of this new, better blue neighborhood, into this heavenly neighborhood, f of x. But in this case, the function is discontinuous, which means part of my neighborhood goes one place, another part goes the other place. And that's kind of not happening. That's not giving, that's not keeping a family person happy. Good? Understood? So those ideas we need to um, describe with just purely mathematically. I'm going to erase those pictures. Yes? So if it's not one to one, how can f inverse exist? Well, that's, a, that's not f inverse, that's pre-image. The symbol does not mean it's one to one, this means a set of all points that are mapped into this ball. If it were one to one, there would only be one interval that's mapped there. So you can see there are plenty. You can see that, look at it, this green neighborhood locally here is one to one, so here is that interval locally here, it's one to one, here is another interval locally here, it's, uh, well, it doesn't have to be one to one as you can see, right? It, 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 basically the pre-image, all it is is that, is that uh, it's, it's really asking which points are mapped into the neighborhood, no more. Okay, so this symbol you have to, it's, it's called pre-image, you have to remember. All right, so I'm erasing this and we're going to try to uh, describe abstract continuity today. So here is, this is a very important theorem. Make sure you understand it. from one metric space to another metric space, the following are equivalent. So condition I F is continuous by delta epsilon. Second condition, it's a sequential condition for any x belonging to M if the sequence xn goes to x, and obviously it means uh, that the distance here is d. If xn goes to x, then the image of the sequence goes to f of x, and here the distance is rho. And now, uh, in terms of closed and open sets, so if E is closed in the metric space N, 
the pre-image is closed in M. Okay, so you understand this is not about inverse uh, functions, this is really asking which points in M are mapped to that particular set E, which things are moved, right? So it could be that, uh, that you have a bunch of neighborhoods from all over the world, like in New York, a bunch of people, like a family comes from, uh, from the Soviet Union, another comes from China, right? And they all are coming to New York. So that's kind of what happens here, right? They are all coming to one place E from who knows where. So, so what we have is that if the set E was closed, the set which, which produced it, which F uh, co collected to produce this E, had to be closed. And then condition four, if V is open in N, then the inverse image of that V is opening M. Okay? So you understand what, what, what a continuous function does. So if this is my space M, what will a continuous function do? It might stretch this, uh, this space and, and it might glue certain points together, but definitely not rip things apart. So what happens is that if I look at some region and that region, uh, uh, in the, the, the basically whatever this region is closed, whatever comes into that region was a closed set. If I see an uh, open neighborhood in my, in, in my codomain N, what came into that neighborhood had to be an open set. Okay, so let's look at, uh, so all those things are equivalent. So let's try to prove it. Proof? So first we can say that condition one implies condition two. How do we know? Well, so if xn goes under the metric d to x, that implies that the distance between xn and x is made smaller than, than, uh, uh, than delta. In fact, smaller than delta epsilon, right? So by assumption, by, by the delta epsilon condition, what do we know? We know that for every epsilon there exists a delta such that whenever the distance uh, between xn and x uh, is smaller than delta, the image of those points, the distance between them is smaller than epsilon. So you see, this implies that the distance goes to zero, and therefore it's smaller than delta of epsilon. And that then, in turn, implies that the distance of f of xn to f of x is smaller than epsilon, which implies the desired result too. It implies that f of xn goes under the metric rho to f of x. So I'm, I want to be sure, I kind of wrote three lines here, I want to be sure you understand how that's supposed to work. I made the assumption i. I made the assumption that f is continuous by the delta epsilon definition, so it's this situation, right? So what does the delta epsilon situation tells me is that if I take x, any point x, and I take uh, all y that are uh, sufficiently close, so there is going to be a bunch, and there is going to be a small neighborhood around x, that's the neighborhood, and the function f will lift that full neighborhood into a neighborhood uh, centered at f of x, of radius epsilon. That's the definition of, uh, of continuity. Okay? So what does it mean about uh, sequences? So if a sequence xn is approaching x, that means that most of the members of the sequence xn are members of that delta neighborhood that's going to be lifted uh, to one place. Do you see that? Right? xn going to x means that all but finitely many are definitely members of that neighborhood that's going to be lifted to the epsilon neighborhood around f of x in n. So then, 
I, uh, that, that implies that, that uh, they, they are within this neighborhood, and that implies they are lifted. As simple as that. And that implies that the sequence f of x n converges to f of x. You should hopefully see that condition 1 feels stronger than condition 2. Because condition 2 only lifts a sequence. Condition 1 lifts a whole neighborhood, lifts uncountably many points surrounding x altogether close to x, to close to f of x, I'm sorry. Good. So now we look and see how condition 2 will imply um, condition 3. Why is that true? Well, condition 3, so if we take E, a subset of N closed, and then we consider the we consider the preimage. Let X be a limit point of the inverse of E, the preimage of E, sorry. You see what I'm trying to do? I, I'm trying to, I, I know that uh, sequences xn converging to x implies f of xn converging to f of x, okay? So I am picking a closed set in n and I'm taking its preimage. So how do I check that it's closed? I, I try to see how it behaves, right? It's a predatory set if any limit point, it's, it's gonna eat it. So I'm saying, okay, let's suppose f is a limit point. If, it's if it eats this point, I know it must be a closed set. Because it's an arbitrary point, I'm just checking, right? I'm, I'm checking, I kind of come into this cage, this is a new creature, and I'm dangling something in front of it, some, some little animal. If it bites, you know it's a predator. So x is a limit point of this inverse, so that means what? Limit point implies existence of a sequence. So that implies that there exists a sequence xn going to x, such that xn, none of them equal x, and each xn is, each xn is a member of the inverse image of E. Okay? So what do we know about this? So, so that means that f of xn go under the metric rho because xn converges to x by assumption 2 the image of the sequence will go to uh, the image of the point x it will go to f of x okay but the sequence f of xn is a sequence that is a subset of e right because if xn this is, this is all this is saying, xn will be mapped by f into e, which means that f of xn are sequences, there are sequences or, or just points along a tentacle of e, which implies that f of x is, is within the reach of the predatory set e. It implies that f of x is part of e. Why? Make sure that you understand. You see what I'm doing? So I look at the at the preimage, and I take a sequence. So, so if this preimage has um, has a limit point, let's say this limit point is x. My goal is to show this limit point is part of that set. How do I do this? Well, the limit point implies a, an existence of a sequence within this preimage that converges to x. So what do I do now? I then lift all those points xn into e. And because I know e is closed, I know that since f of xn converges to f of x, e has to eat f of x. So that f of x is part of e. And what does that imply? That implies that x is in the pre-image of e. This is like a passive test. F, f has mapped x into e. X is mapped by f into e. 
That's what this is. Okay. So it means that uh, that that the inverse image of E eats all limit points. Which implies it's closed. And we're done. Good. You remember this? What I'm saying is we have two metrics. One is M, one is N. And if I just somehow know, the, the, uh, basically, if I know one of those uh, conditions, one through four, I know the function is continuous. Okay? So we have shown that three, uh, that two implies three. Now we want to show that three implies Four, that closed sets means uh, that the same thing will be true when I take privileges of open sets. So how do we know that? Well, let V be an open subset of N. We want to show that the inverse image is open. Then, F inverse of, I should say maybe like this, then the complement is closed the complement is closed by definition in N. So then what I do is um, we can think of E being equal to V complement and then by condition 3 F inverse of E which is the inverse of V complement is a closed set. Of M. And what does this imply? Now observe. Observe that that M uh, will be equal to the union of F inverse of V and F inverse V complement. You see why? Again, the function is going to take the whole of M and, and each point in M goes somewhere. Okay? So what is the same? Every point in M either goes into V or it does not go into V. In other words, it goes to V complement. Not going into V means it goes to V complement. Make sense? Those two sets are disjoint. You see, because a point cannot go both into V and V complement. Let me uh, make sure that you see. So those are disjoint. So what does it imply? It implies that It implies that F inverse of V complement is equal to F inverse of V complement and this guy is closed.
So the implication is if the complement of the set is closed, the set is open. So that implies that f inverse of v, which is equal to f inverse of v complement, complement is open. And we're done. Yes? Can we skip all of those steps? Of course. Uh, if you see, yeah, as long as you see, so, so this is just uh, pure logic, right? What, what do I know? What I have to operate here is I know that pre images of closed sets are closed. I want to show that that automatically implies that pre image of open sets must be open. So, how do I do that? Well, I, I, try, I try to take the pre image uh, of V and I see what's the complement. The complement is F inverse V complement. So, this set is closed. We know that. We know this is closed by hypothesis 3. Since what's inside is closed, the pre-image must be closed by hypothesis 3. So if this is closed, that guy must be open. That's it. How about um, if we go another step above that, when we say that if inverse of E is equal to F inverse of B complement, can we then take the complement of F inverse of V complement? Is there a property that says... So that it's V, yes. Uh, the, the, the inverse, the complement of... Uh, F inverse uh, complement is uh, just, just right. But make sure that you see it, right? Uh, yes, of course. Can we skip all of that? You can skip it? all of that uh, as long as you as you as long as you know that uh, that this, right? As long as you know that this is true, F inverse of uh, complement is equal uh, is equal to that guy, right? So this here e inside equals to this. Well, I mean I wrote it here, right? This is the statement. So you can skip all of it and say F inverse of V complement. I'm checking that this is an open set. So I take the complement and I want to see that the complement is closed. Remember, open and closed, they, they are related. You just, uh, if you take a complement of an open set, you must see a closed set. And, by, and, and, that's, the, and that's the defining characteristic, okay? So if I see that the complement is closed, I'm done. So I look at this, this guy is the same as that, and I know it's closed. So you can actually just reduce it to this one line. Okay? So I want to still keep the statements here. I'm going to I'm going to erase this part of the board. Finally, uh, I want to go and say that four implies one. In fact, four is it seems stronger than one. Why that is true? So, so what we do is uh, let v equal to ball of radius epsilon around f of x, where the ball is in n. Okay, that's an open set. Then f inverse of v must be open. By hypothesis four. Okay. Observe that X belongs to the pre image of V. You see why, right? Well, where is x mapped? It's mapped uh, right into the center. So, uh, so of course, it's going to be uh, part of the pre-image. Right? What is this? This is uh, all the points that are mapped into this uh, open ball around f of x. Really, x is, is going there. It's going right through the center. But the set f inverse is open. But since f inverse v is open, there must be be 
an open ball. We can call it ball of radius delta around x, which is part of the preimage. V. And the implication is simply that the image of the ball of radius delta around x is a subset of V. And what's V? V is just the ball of radius epsilon around f of x. This is exactly the delta epsilon definition. Make sense? Right, so let's consider, let's consider examples. Let's try to look how this works. So by the way, if you ever take topology, condition four. You see, in topology, the space might be so complicated that you don't even know if a metric space is defined, or one is not convenient, and sometimes one is not possible to define. There are topological spaces where a metric is not possible to give. So what you do is the definition of continuity that generalizes is uh, condition number four or condition number three, they are equivalent. So uh, three and four are the definitions of continuity of when you study topology. You understand? I'm going to try to give you a few examples and see if you, so if you can, just based on pre-images or, or based on any of those observations, can you figure out if the set is, is if the function is continuous or not. We'll try to play this game with, uh, with we try to, to do it using several of the ideas. One, two, three, and four are all the same. So whenever you can observe any of them to be true, all the others are. So example, so we have the function, characteristic function of Q, and it's defined from R to R by if I take any x in R, I just pay attention to whether it's rational or not. So it's equal to 1 if it's the indicator, right? If x is a rational number, and it's equal to 0 if x is not a rational number, okay? So, is this function continuous or not? Or at which points is the function not continuous? Not continuous at uh, x is So we can, we can imagine drawing this function. If we draw this function, how would it look? The drawing cannot, the drawing actually will be, will look a bit strange. So we would have this red line. It would look solid, but uh, this red line is just uh, it's one, and all Q is mapped there. And the other line looks solid, even though there there are certain, in a sense uh, some holes. There is another line that looks like like this, and that's zero. So it's not a solid line. What ma what's mapped to 0? Only irrational numbers. What's mapped to 1? Only the rational numbers. In other words, the, the pre-image of this, of this um, point 1 is countable, whereas the pre-image of 0 is going to be an uncountable set. Okay. So notice that uh, this function does not appear to be continuous anywhere. So why is it not continuous anywhere? Because, well, I can take, let's say, I can take condition 2, sequential condition. Take any x, OK? I don't know if this x is rational or not, but uh, I can see that if I take a sequence, if, if xn is a sequence of rational numbers such that xn goes to x, what do we observe? We observe that f of xn will go into the point, forget about this x, it will go to what value? f of xn goes where? 
if I go, oh, if you see, rational numbers are dense in the number line. So I can approach this x by rational points. So I, I can select a rational point here, and a rational point here, and a rational point here. I can, I can, I can sneak my way by, uh, by jumping over rational numbers towards x. What's f of x n approaching? Uh, well, in this case, if xn is in q, what does it approach? 1. On the other hand, if, yeah, sorry, here, if xn is not in q, that means irrational, such that irrationals are also dense, if you did the homework, you remember. So xn goes to this point x. Whatever this x is, I know that f of xn will approach 0. So you see that whatever x, x is either mapped to 0 or to 1, but this, we have a bunch of sequences that don't go to the same place, so it cannot be continuous at this, at this x. So by property 2, by sequential property, cannot be continuous. anywhere. Okay? Let's try let's try other um, other let's try the other condition. So let's try condition number four. Right? So condition number four is the way you detect uh, lack of continuity is that you find an open set in the codomain and its preimage is not open. If that happens the function cannot be continuous. So can we do that? So that's one way to do that. Now let's try uh, try to do this. So let's suppose that we look at this point one, and we select a neighborhood of uh, I draw it let's say of radius one quarter. So this is this guy here is a ball of radius. One quarter center that one. Center that one. Yes? It's that green line. Now, what's going to be the pre image of, uh, of that ball? The pre image of that ball is going to be the whole of R intersected with. So the preimage of this ball will be uh, the whole of R intersected with Q. And it's, it, it cannot be open. Let's see, let's see if you remember how many reasons can you give me why it's not open. So I take the inverse image of the ball of radius 1 quarter. You can, you can stretch it more. In fact, you can stretch the ball all the way to radius 1. I just drew a small ball, right? So ball of radius 1 quarter centered at 1. And I take the pre-image. Do you understand what goes here, right? So first of all, it, it, within one quarter, it does not contain zero. Right? The image of the real number line is two points, zero and one. You understand? The, the image of the whole solid real number line is condensed into two points. Part of it goes to zero, the other part goes to one. So the pre-image of the ball of, of radius one quarter around one, it does not contain the point zero. And therefore, it must be the whole of R intersected with Q, which is not open. You agree it's not open? Give me uh, a few a few reasons why this ball is not open. Because the open ball has always irrational. Uh, the open ball will have to have an irrational number. Why? Because uh, any open ball in R must be uncountable. And this is intersection with Q, in fact. So what is this image? It's just Q. Uh, I, I said R intersection Q. Maybe I should have just simply said Q. Okay? In fact, let's try to imagine all sorts of open balls. Let's see what, 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 what are the possibilities. So I select a random open ball. What could be the pre-image? So if I select um, an open ball that only contains 0 but does not contain 1, the preimage is going to be? Irrational. 
all the irrational numbers. You see that? If I select an open ball in the codomain centered at zero, what is the preimage? What are the points that are mapped to zero? An open ball around zero, it's, it's an open neighborhood of R, but the preimage contains only the irrational numbers. And that cannot possibly be open because you remember the open sets in R are always intervals. And that means you have to contain rational numbers. And there is no, it's impossible to come up with an open ball that does not contain rational numbers. Do you understand? Can you, I'm having trouble understanding what you mean by pre-image. Can you draw that on the graph? The pre-image? Uh, this what graph is? is so complicated that I cannot. Because, uh, because uh, it, it basically a bunch of points, a solid, it would look like a solid number of points and they would go to this red line. And in other words, they go to a point. And others stay. So all the irrational numbers stay at, uh, at zero. So the, all the irrational numbers, they, they are mapped to the zero. And all the, and all the uh, rational numbers are mapped to one. Okay? Let's try to understand what this function is doing for, for a moment. Right? So here is a number line. Okay? Number line is, is a solid thing. We're going to learn it a bit more. Right? So this solid thing. What's, what's, what is this function doing to this object? Oh, so the pre-image is all of the... Right, the pre-image is basically, is, is, is you, 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 you see a function does something, so what you imagine is that this, this number line is broken apart, torn apart, point by point. Because you see, you have uh, rational and irrational points in the same neighborhood. So those neighborhoods are turned apart, turned to shreds. A bunch of them go to one, and others are going to zero. So what happened, you had one solid object, and it was torn apart to shreds, and then a bunch of the shreds are coll collapsed to, to singularities, one at zero and the other at one. Do you see what, what happened here? So intuitively, continuous functions are not supposed to create two objects out of one. They're not supposed to, because creating two objects out of one means that you rip the fabric. And this function rips the fabric in an extreme way. It rips it completely, and then glues together all the irrationals at zero, and all the rationals it glues at one. So what are the open, open balls? What are the pre-images of open balls? So any open ball that does not contain zero, but contains one, the pre-image will be all of rational numbers. Any open ball that contains uh, zero, but not one, the pre-image is irrational numbers. An open ball that contains both zero and one, pre-image is, if I, have, uh, if I have an open set that contains zero and one, what would be the pre-image? R. R, everything, okay? So the possibilities are Q, R, and then we can also select an open ball that contains neither zero nor one, the pre-image then is the empty set, which is open, you understand? So, uh, so we can just combinatorially check the pre-images of all open sets. They are either um, the whole of R, or the Q, or the irrational numbers, or the empty set. You see, so some of them are still open, but we can find neighborhoods that have pre-images that are not open, okay? So that was uh, one example. Let's try to see uh, what other examples we might give. So I'll keep this on the board, I'll just erase this part here. So there is a, a whole class of functions. There is a whole class of functions uh, from m to n, and here, of course, I mean that they are given their respective space, their respective metrics, uh, and it's called isometry. If if the if the distance in M of the images of two points f of x and f of y, the distance is then the same as what it used to be originally x to y, right? So an isometry is a, is a type of function that preserves distances. 
Now, why is it called isometry? Because think about the geometry of what this means, right? So here is an example of an isometry. This is uh, a rectangle in R2. And now I can take a map and I map it into R3, you see? It used to be flat, uh, flat on the ground, flat on the x, y axis. Now I lift it. You see there was a twist of sorts, right? I lifted it. And the object is now in three, in three dimensions. It's injected into a three-dimensional space. Now, do you see that the distances, uh, I could kind of imagine the distances, uh, I can trace them back on the same paper, they have not changed. Right? Now, to, to measure the distances between two points, we use the norm that involves, uh, uh, let's say, three coordinates. But actually, that distance from, from, any, from, from the x that used to be on, and y that used to be on horizontal x, y axis, f of x and f of y have three coordinates, but the distance is preserved. Now, isometry is, as you can imagine, very continuous. It's, 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 it's really like a trivial transformation, in a sense. So you don't change distances. So all geometric transformations, when you take a, a, a triangle and move it onto, onto an equivalent triangle, just rotate and move it, right? So those are isometric motions. So isometries are continuous. Now, how can we verify? Which property can we easily use for continuity? I would say the easiest is, I think one is the easiest, right? The delta epsilon definition, uh, what would be, so given, given epsilon, what do you, you said delta equal to? Given epsilon bigger than zero, set, Delta of epsilon equal to, let's say if you can tell me what delta of epsilon equals to, then I, I, can, I know that you understand. Epsilon. epsilon. Exactly. So you understand. Why? Because I don't need to, you see, I can use the same distance, right? If the distance of y to x used to be less than, uh, than epsilon, then it will remain less than epsilon when I, uh, when I take the image of this function. The function neither brings points closer nor brings them farther apart. And there is, of course, an example when the function always brings them closer. It might be, it might be Lipschitz. That's another thing, Lipschitz function. So let's see. So an example of an isometry, here is one example. So you might have the point x, y mapped. So this is in R2, right? So x, y. So we might have the function, let's say, uh, f from R2 into R3. And I'm going to give you the trivial, a trivial example, which is uh, f of x, y. It just takes you x and y and then uh, writes this as phi. What's, what's, what's happening here? This is a very easy geometric transformation. So we used to have uh, the plane. And what did we do? We lifted it to the fifth, uh, to the fifth uh, floor. Right? So I go and I lift the entire plane to the fifth floor. That's clearly an isometry. It could be, of course, very complicated isometries. All right, so let's look at another example. Suppose that we look at a function f from the natural numbers into, into r, I think. And let it be any function. Any function. Do you recognize this type of function? Those are the sequences. Those are the real valued sequences. And when I don't mention a metric, if I didn't say what's the metric on R, 
it's the absolute volume metric. If I haven't mentioned the metric on the natural numbers, it's the absolute volume metric. Okay? So what can you say about any, any such function? Without any work, I know the function is continuous. How do I know it's continuous? Let's look at open balls. Okay. So what I can do is I can uh, I can use delta epsilon, right? So if if uh, n is an element of the natural numbers, uh, pick. Pick delta to always, no matter what n is, right? Pick delta to always equal, um, to always equal one half. You can make it one quarter, so always one half. So then, the ball of radius one half centered at this n is simply what? The ball of radius one half. Notice it's radius one half. Which point does it pick in n? Okay. Only, only n itself. In other words, the natural numbers is a discrete space. You see, a discrete space is one where, uh, where you you have an open neighborhood uh, small enough around each point such that it only it, it isolates this point. That's why it's called discrete. You see this guy? He has like his own protective suit. So it means that every subset of the natural numbers is open. Every subset S of the natural numbers is open. So you see what I can do? So in that case, I can just take F inverse. So if V is, is, is a subset of R, F inverse of V will be a subset of the natural numbers is open. So in particular, if V is open, I just, I just picked any, any subset, right? Take any subset in R, take the pre-image, it's, it's always going to be open. Because we verify that every subset in the natural numbers is open. So that means that it's, uh, it's, it's automatically continuous by condition 4. Make sense? One more example. So now let's reverse the role. Let's say that we take a function from R to the natural numbers. So if f is continuous, if the function is continuous, then must, what it must be, then f must be a constant. It cannot be anything else but a constant. I'll leave it for you to verify. We'll talk about it next class. So the question that I leave with, why? <laughs>